Hey, good evening. I hope everybody had a nice uh, break. Did you have a good break? It's, as I always say, this is the remnant of the remnant. In other words, you guys are here on time, so guess what we do? We start on time. And for those that are online, thank you for joining us online. Well, there's normally, I don't know, 15, 20 people that watch it online, so we're glad that you're back with us. So what the Bible really says, this is a big, big weekend. It's amazing that we even have Brother Tom back with us. And that is a miracle in itself. Brother Tom, all the way from Gig Harbor, Washington, has joined us. So, Tom, we're glad that you're with us. Gigarite. Okay, so anyway, so it's starting to rain outside. Aren't you glad it's raining? I got to go make sure our trusty ushers have that umbrella to make sure that nobody gets wet. We don't want anybody to get wet, right? I can ponder that thought too, but anyway, it's good being with you. And then, you know, following our, our meeting tonight, again, there's refreshments, some good, good refreshments um, when we leave. Again, encouraging those people who are online. Oh, you're missing out on the refreshments. You can watch it online, but you're miss missing out on the treats at the end. So um, you have to come to the church so you have the, the treats. How's that? So, hey, why don't we uh, begin with prayer, and then Pastor Nehemiah will get right into this thing. I always make the announcements as short as I can so we can get hear more of the Word of God tonight. Amen? So let's pray. Loving Father, I just want to thank you for... Uh, blessing us with your presence. You are such a gracious, good God. Um, you are worthy to be praised and worshiped, and we are thankful for this uh, house of worship that we can come um, here at Tacoma, Washington. And thank you for your servant, Pastor Nehemiah, who has uh, been blessing us from night to night. And here, as we took a little, few days off, we look forward to this weekend with the uh, messages that we'll hear that, uh, you know, the, the truths of your word will be uplifting to our very hearts and preparing us for uh, the scenes in which we're living. Um, so we just pray your blessing upon our study tonight and be with all those that are in the process of arriving. We love you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, God bless you and God bless Pastor Nehemiah. Amen. Scott, good evening everyone. All right. Trust and pray that you've had a blessed week, and I uh, want to add my welcome to that of Pastor Scott. Welcome to our What the Bible Really Says series as we continue tonight. I want to welcome those who are joining us here in person as well as those who are joining us online. Excited that you have taken the time to be with us uh, this evening. I, again, I trust and pray that you've had a blessed week, a good week. Um, anytime God is in our day, it's a good day, regardless of... Uh, regardless of what we go through, what we, uh, what we face. Um, I also just want to say that I've had uh, a blessed week uh, praying for, for all of you. Uh, one of the things that, um, that comes my way is the names of those that have been attending our meetings, and the purpose of that is just to, uh, um, to pray for you, as well as we, wanna, we also want to build connections and build relationships with you, because I believe that the kingdom is all about relationships. It's all about... Uh, you know, Jesus Christ. And so I'm excited um, to be here this evening. Today I had a, a wonderful field trip to an art museum with my six-year-old son and his kindergarten class. Um, so it was fun to ride the bus with him, Brother Tom, um, and, all those, and all those kids, you know. So um, had a lot of fun, and we just went to the art museum, and my son loved it. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for the time that I can share um, and spend with my first ministry, my first church, is my family. And I, and I pray to each and every one of you here um, that you would also remember that, that your first church, your first ministry is to your family. Um, and so I praise God for, for my family. I've also been enjoying um, my, my son who was born two weeks ago, last night, um, made two weeks, or no, tonight will make two weeks, I'm sorry, Thursday, uh, at exactly 9.06 p.m. tonight. He'll be two weeks old. And so um, I'm excited about, about our son. And so just praise the Lord for each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, and we'll dive right into our topic this evening. I have 18 questions that I need to cover tonight from the Word of God um, and with the Word of God uh, regarding this, this important topic. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for your presence here tonight. Holy Spirit, we just pray now that you would speak your word uh, to me, through me, and for me. 
I pray that Jesus will be lifted up. John chapter 12, verse 32. Once again, it says, Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And then Jesus also said in John chapter 6, verse 63, that the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And so we pray that you would speak life to us tonight. And then, Father, I also pray for the promise of the Holy Spirit. According to Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus, you said that if we who are wicked are willing to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit when you ask? And so we're asking, Father, for more of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, Lord, you said that your word will go forth and will not return to you empty or void, but will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. And we pray that you will speak your word tonight and that it would land on good soil, the good soil of our hearts, and that it will transform and change us into your very image again. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the powerful, beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. I would like to begin tonight by just asking this, um, or, or, or making this, um, asking this question. Imagine a world, imagine here in the United States and here in Washington State, if there were no laws, it would be every man for himself. You can just do whatever you want. Um, I believe that if, if this state, the state of Washington, and here in Tacoma, if we had no laws, can you imagine what that would look like? We would have total anarchy and chaos. And so what I'm going to share with you this evening is of vital importance. And by the way, this entire weekend will be a cluster of connected, powerful truths from the Word of God that I think that, that I believe that are vital to our Christian experience in our walk with Jesus Christ and our relationship with God. And so this weekend, I'm going to cover some very, very um, important topics. For example, tonight is God's law of love. Tomorrow, I'm going to be sharing about the Sabbath, God's sign of rest and faith. And then, um, and then we're also going to go through other topics. For example, um, the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And then on Saturday night, the mark of the beast. And so I'm covering some heavy hitters uh, this weekend. And uh, you're going to see um, how beautifully connected the truth is in God's word and the importance of that. And, and by the way, I, again, I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize that it's not just a cognitive understanding of truth. It's not a mental assent to truth that is needed. Because there are many, there are many who, who will, even, will even state in a series like this, I know that to be true. I know that to be truth from the Word of God. And, and while they may have an understanding and comprehend the truth, I believe that it's more important that the truth be applied to our lives and that it transforms us and leads us into a deeper relationship with God. Because what good is it if we have all the knowledge of Scripture and, and yet it doesn't change our lives? Like, if, if, and I've heard people say this. I've heard people say, Pastor Nehemiah, I... Man, as I'm listening to you, I'm convicted that what you're presenting from the Word of God is the truth. But, you know, and, and so I don't just want us to have an understanding of truth. I want us to, I want us to have an encounter with the truth because in Jesus, in Jesus, he said in John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, Jesus said this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so therefore... Jesus declares himself to be the truth. He's definitive. There are not many ways to heaven. There are not, there are not many different truths. And there's only one way of life. And that life is in Jesus Christ. And so tonight, family, we're going to look at this very, very important topic. Um, God's law of love. So I just want you to think about that. What would this... What would this uh, state, this nation, this planet look like if there were no laws to govern? And um, it has been reported that there are over 3,500 laws in the United States alone. And yet God has boiled his laws down to only 10. The moral fabric of our society is unraveling quickly as situation ethics and political correctness hurtle to the forefront. We have taken prayer out of schools and wonder why kids are shooting other kids. We have taken Christ out of everything 
and wonder why greed and materialism are on the rise. We have taken God's law from our society and wonder why our culture is crumbling into chaos with sexual perversion and violence. In this topic tonight, we shall explore God's love and as surrendered Christians, how we are to relate to them. So the first question this evening, by the way, in the Torah, the first five book, books of the Bible, there are 613 laws and commandments in the first five books of the Bible, 613. And yet God, and yet God has brought, brought um, and shared with us his commandments, which are 10. And you can find those commandments in the book of Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. But I'm going to share with you as we're, as we're going through this topic tonight that the law of God and the law of love has existed from eternity past. It has always existed. Because just as God himself is eternal, God himself is immutable. His law is also eternal, and his law is immutable. So we're going to look at this tonight. The law really is a transcript of God's character. And so the first question that we have tonight is, right from the jump, who wrote the Ten Commandments? Who wrote the Ten Commandments? The only portion of the Bible that we know of, um, and we believe that all of the Bible has been inspired by the Holy Spirit, um, who moved upon people to write this sacred book. However, according to this question, in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, here's what the Word of God says. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with what? Written with the finger of God. So according to this text, and when you read the context, it's talking about the Ten Commandments, the moral law that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gave them those two tablets. Okay, so Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. So this is important because if God wrote this with his own finger, that means that there's permanency. That means that it's, it's, it's eternal. Um, and because what's happening in our society and in our world, even in the Christian world, sadly, is that there are many who actually believe that the law of God is no longer uh, relevant, that the law of God is outdated, that it's old fashioned, that, uh, and, and that it no longer matters for the Christian. Well, I, I want to share with you from the Word of God that nothing can be further from the truth. Again, you can't separate God from His law because, it's, again, it's a transcript of His character. That's why we're talking about, according to 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, again, it records for us that God is what, everybody? God is love. God is love. And so, therefore, we're going to discover that the law is also love. And, 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 and this is the foundation of God's government is his law. Just like any other nation or country um, on, on this planet, we are governed by laws. Now, I know that, you know, there are some laws that, <laughs> that, are, that are questionable. But one of the things that we can know from the word of God is that God's law is a, is a law of love and that it is, praise be to God, it's a beautiful, beautiful law. And again, we're going to take a look at it in just a moment here, um, that, that Ten Commandment law that's given to us in Exodus chapter 20. Question number two, what is promised to those who follow God's commands? What is promised to those who follow God's commands? Psalm, Psalm chapter 112, verses 1 to 3. Here's what it says. Praise the Lord. Bless, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his what? In his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures for how long? Endures for forever. And so right here it talks about um, that those who, those who obey the law of God, those who follow the law of God, it says that you are blessed. And also um, for those who delight greatly in his commandments, um, or the Lord delights greatly in his commandments, and those who fear him and they, they follow his commandments, his descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. You recall the other night in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, one of the signs that Jesus said um, of his soon return is that in the end, it says that the love of many, because lawlessness abounds, because lawlessness abounds, because iniquity abounds, 
it says that the, the love of many will grow what, everybody? Will grow cold. And when we look around our world today, and not just out in the world, but even in the church, we see that the love of many has gone cold. Why? Because we are not, we are not in love with Christ, and as a result of not being in love with Christ and, and in love with his law, then the natural, the, natural, um, the natural tendency then is to be cold and to, and to be self-serving and to be self-centered and to be selfish. And so we look at all these things and we see that the law of God, as we're going to discover in a moment, uh, family is a, is a law of love. So the Bible says that we're blessed and the generation that follows will be upright. They too will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Question number three, what was the conclusion of King Solomon, the wisest king who ever lived? What was his conclusion? In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, here's what he writes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his what? And keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So here's how, here's how Solomon just sums it all up. He said this is the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the conclusion of life itself. This is what life is all about. He's saying that... We need to fear God. And by the way, fearing God is having respect for God, reverence for God, being in awe of God. Let me ask you a question. Do we see a lot of irreverence today? Do we see a lot of disrespect today? Do we see a lot of uh, uh, you know, folks who no longer care about, care about the law of God? Um, they, they don't care about the sanctity of life and, and all these things, the sanctity of many things that, that are in the scriptures. But it says here, Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And what else, everybody? Keep his commandments. For this is man's all. Or in another translation, it says, for this is the, the duty of man. And then it says, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Again, to fear God is to respect him. One of the ways that we show respect to God is through obedience to him. Question number four, how does God describe King David? How does God describe King David? In the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, the Bible says, and afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, who will do all my what? Will do all my will. Now, I got I to gotta, I gotta also put this out there, though. Was David perfect? No? Yeah, he was human. Did he, did he, did he have uh, many flaws and did he do some terrible things? Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's, here's what, what God is referring to when he says that David is a man after my own heart. Unlike Saul who was unwilling to repent, unwilling to repent, not willing to repent, not willing to surrender, not willing to submit to the will of God. David, on the other hand, although he was, although he was guilty of committing many crimes, I mean, putting one of his best friends to death to have his wife, he was guilty of murder, he was guilty of adultery, he was guilty of all these things. And yet, praise be to God that according to the book of Psalm, chapter 51 and verse 10 and 11, David recognized the battle and the struggle within the human heart. And David also understood that on his own, he doesn't stand a chance against sin and against his flesh. He understood this. So what is he crying out for? What is he praying for? In the book of Psalm chapter 51, verses 10 and 11, he says, create in me a what? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David understood the struggle. By the way, the apostle Paul also speaks about their struggle over there in the book of Romans chapter 7, where he says that there's a, there's a constant struggle between the spirit and the flesh. And he said, and oftentimes I find myself, while I know the right thing to do, I find myself not doing that. And the thing that I should not be doing, I find myself doing. Why? Because he understands the struggle, the tension that exists between the spirit and the flesh, which is why, which is why, family, it is, it is, it is, 
it is important for us to understand that we cannot take on the devil, the world, sin, self, the flesh in our own power because we're going to fail every single time. But praise be to God, Jesus conquered the world. Jesus conquered sin. Jesus conquered the flesh. Jesus conquered it all. And through him, we too can have the victory. It's available to us through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm so thankful, as I mentioned the other night, that there are things that I, that I struggled with in the past. And, and when I was doing that, those things on the street, but praise be to God, praise be to God and glory to God that through him, I've gained the victory over those things. But I got to keep trusting him. I've got to keep leaning into him. I've got to stay connected to the source because I can't do it on my own. Praise be to God that he is powerful, all powerful, that he can help us overcome any situation. That's the gospel, folks. I mean, what kind of gospel, what kind of good news would, would it be to tell somebody who's struggling with some type of addiction, oh, you know what, that's okay. You're never going to overcome that. You'll never, you'll never, get, you'll never get past that. It's, it's just something that you're going to have to deal with with the rest of your life. What kind of good news is that? That's not good news. That's just, that basically, you're just enabling people to continue on in a lifestyle that you know is not according to the word of God. The gospel, the good news is that God, God can help you overcome anything. And again, I'm putting the onus on God. You see, you see where, I'm, where I'm putting it? It's through him and him alone that we can be more than conquerors. Would you say amen? amen. Praise God. But it's only through Jesus. David understood this. Now, but this, and by the way, this is a testimony of David from God himself. These are, this, this is what he's saying about David. <laughs> that's the other thing is, uh, you know, that's how you know that the Holy Spirit is at work. Because we don't go around, we don't go around parading and blowing our own, our own trumpet that we've accomplished something and achieved something and say, hey, you know, look at me. I did this in my own strength and in my own power. No. We give all the glory and the praise to God for what he's done. Amen? So that's what, that's what, that's what the testimony of Scripture is regarding David uh, by God. And, and question number five, what was David's attitude towards God's law? What was David's attitude towards God's law? Psalm chapter 119, verses 166 through 168. Lord, I hope for your what? salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Now, I want you to understand, even, even in this passage, I want you guys to notice something. Look at the order. Look at the order. What is first? Lord, I hope for your what? Salvation. So as we receive salvation or the grace of God as a gift, I want you to notice what happens then as a result of receiving grace and receiving salvation from God. We don't continue on in sin, in, 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 in willing sin, in willful sin. We don't continue on in that, in that. We now, it says, Lord, I hope for your salvation and I do your what? Commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. David loved God and was obedient to his law, and God in turn called David a man after his own heart. Obedience, family, is important to God. Obedience is important to God. Anybody, any parents in here? Any, any parents in here? Uh, would like to get rid of commandment number five? Where it says, honor thy father and thy mother? Is that, let me ask a question, is that still a good commandment? Is that still relevant today? Because I, I don't know of any parent in their right mind that, that would not love that commandment and would not love for their children to be obedient to them. That, that, that's just asinine, that, that's crazy. To think, but, but of course, you know, we live in a society today where, hey, you know, according to the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, 19 and 20, it says that we live in a day and age where people call 
good evil and evil good and take light for darkness and darkness for light. But, I mean, think about it. What, what, it and we're going to look at it in just a moment here, but any of those Ten Commandments, which one do you want to get rid of? <laughs> which, one is not, which one is not relevant? Which one is not good for us? They're all good. They're all good. And so, this is what David's attitude towards God's law was. Question number six. What did Paul say about God's law? Romans chapter 7, verse 12 It says, therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and what, everybody? Good. Does that sound like God? Does that sound like characteristics and attributes of God as well? Can we say that God is holy? Can we say that God is just? Can we say that God is good? Oh, yeah, we say that all the time. God is good, right? And so, again, Paul here is talking about the commandment, the law. Now, when you, and I'm going to go with me real quickly in your Bibles. Same chapter, Romans chapter 7. And please look with me at verses 7 and 8. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. The reason why I want to bring this up is because it's important for us to understand which law is being spoken of here. Let's look at the context, okay? Because it's important to understand also that Paul when speaking of the law, oftentimes he would speak about all the laws, right? Because you got to understand that every time Paul was addressing um, his audience, his audience, right? There were many Jewish converts to Christianity, and so he had to expound to them about the whole righteousness by faith and all of these, you know, the importance of that. Um, Not getting caught up in legalism was his message to the Galatians, Okay, so there's a lot of things that Paul had to address. And whenever he spoke about law, um, we have to understand what law he's referring to. Now, notice what it says in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And if you're there, church family, would you say amen? The Bible here says, and listen to Paul. What shall we say then? Is the law what? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the what? Ooh, by the law. Oh, by the way, in this very same book in chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says that, Paul says that, that the law gives us a knowledge of sin. This is how we know what sin is. This is how we know what immorality is. It's by God's law. Or else we would not have, we would not have a knowledge of what sin is. Unless the, unless the law reveals it to us, right? And so, and so check this out. He goes on to say, Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known what? Lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not what? Covet. Okay, so what, what, what law is he referring to? He's referring to the Ten Commandments, because the Tenth Commandment of that, of that moral law is, Thou shalt not what? Covet. So the context is clear that he's talking about the only way that we can know sin is by the law. (laughs) Check this out, verse 8. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of uh, compensence, for without the law, sin was what? Sin was dead. Okay? And and, and man, I wish we can can really expound on more of this stuff, but... Paul here says in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And then over here, he says that we have a knowledge of the law or we know sin by the law. And what law is that? It's the Ten Commandments. It's the Ten Commandments. Question number seven. When Christ came to this world, did he come to abolish the law? Okay. He came to fulfill it. That's right. Let's look at what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And by the way, this is Jesus' own words. He says, do not think. Do not think that I came to what? Destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to what? But to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle by no means 
uh, by no, will by no means pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay? So Jesus himself said, do not think. Don't even entertain the thought. Don't think about it. Don't think, don't think like that. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, the word fulfill just simply means that Jesus came to live the law out. He came to magnify and, up, and uplift the law. Because when you read the very next text in verses 19 and 20 of that same chapter, Jesus said that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine what that sounded like to the audience that was there who heard him say that? Because according to them, when they looked at the scribes and Pharisees and the religious leaders, they looked at like the epitome of those who should be saved. <laughs> right? But they were a pity. And, and, and that's why when you think about it, you think about it. And by the way, they were very legalistic. They were, I mean, they, they believed that, that the law, you know, kept externally would earn them salvation and earn them, earn them heaven. So they were thinking that by their keeping of the law, that they can earn salvation and earn heaven. Family, I'm here, to, I'm here to announce to you this evening, praise be to God, that according to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we are told that we are saved by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. However, however, it's important for us to understand that what, what is the result of being in that relationship with Jesus Christ? You're going to discover that he's going to do something on your heart and on your mind. He's going to put his law there. He's going to do what we cannot do for ourselves. He's going to do that in, in us, family. And, and we're going to find ourselves so in love with Christ that we are rendering loving obedience to God. It's not something like, oh, you know, it's a drag. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, 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 no. Anyone who's in a marriage relationship understands this. Right? Hello? Anybody out there? Yeah. Anybody in a marriage relationship understands this? When, 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 when you're in love and you're, and you're married and you're committed to each other, then guess what? You're going to, you're going to be faithful out of love. You're going, to, you're going to make your spouse happy out of love. Of course, you know, we want those things to be in the Lord. Would you say amen? Amen. Not outside of, not outside of God's will, all right? So I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just, I want to bring that, I want to make that very clear. So Jesus said here, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And by the way, when he fulfilled it, because we know, we know that according to scripture, and by the way, go ahead and jot this down. It's in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 gives us the definition of sin. What is the definition of sin? According to what John writes there, he says that um, for sin is the transgression or the breaking or the violation of God's law. Okay? That's, that's the Bible definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. So, what was Christ's attitude towards those who broke the law, and taught others to do the same. What was his attitude? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, he says, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called what? Great in the kingdom of heaven. So in heaven's eyes, for anyone who goes contrary to the law of God and teaches others to go contrary to the law of God, it says that they are least in the eyes of heaven. Because it's not just a violation of God's law. It's not just a breaking of God's law. It's a total rejection of who God is, his character. Okay? But now it says, but those who keep the law of God and teach others to do so, they are considered great in the eyes of heaven because they are following God's will. They are, they are being obedient to God's will and to his commandments. Question number nine, what did Jesus say about those who obey the word of God? Luke chapter 11, verse 28. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do what? Keep it. So just hearing it is those who hear the word of God and keep it. You know, in another place in the gospel, Jesus said this. He says, why do you 
Why do you hear my teachings, but you don't, you don't do them? <laughs> and and when, you read, when you read about his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the greatest sermon ever, ever preached, the greatest sermon ever you know, recorded, right there on the, on the Sermon on the Mount, when you, read, when you read in Matthew chapter 7, the very last portion of it, Jesus describes the difference between the wise and the foolish man. <laughs> the wise and the foolish man, he, he, he tells the difference. He, he says, what is the difference between being wise and foolish? He says that the wise man built his house upon the rock, while the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And when the winds came and when the storm hit, it says that, that man who built his house on the rock, and by the way, that rock is none other than Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? Jesus Christ. We find out in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, where he says that upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that says that the spiritual rock that followed Israel in the wilderness was none other than Jesus. <laughs> so he said that the wise man built his house upon the rock. And he said, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And when the storm came, when all these winds of doctrine were blowing that Paul talks about, when all the deception comes and all these things come at us, guess what? Those who have built their house upon the solid foundation of the rock and the solid foundation of God's word will remain standing. Praise God. Praise the Lord. That's what he says. And what does he say? He says, basically in that, in that parable he tells in Matthew chapter 7, he says that this is the difference between those who hear my word and do it. And those who hear it and don't do it. That's, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Family, we can come night after night after night to a series like this. We can attend series after series after series. Here's my question. What are you going to do with all the truth that you hear? What are you going to do with Jesus? <laughs> because folks can hear this, and, and, and we preachers can preach it until we're blue in the face. But the, but the question is, Lord, Here's my prayer. Even as I'm preaching this, I'm praying, Lord, as, as, you are, are, as, as I'm listening to this through your word, please, Lord, bring me into harmony with your will at all times. Next question is, what did Jesus say we are, we are to do if we love him? Oh, yeah. What did Jesus say we are to do if we love him? Well, he listened to the words of Jesus himself. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my what? Keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. By the way, over and over you'll see that Jesus often said that he kept his Father's commandments. And then, and then he said to his followers, keep my commandments. As I have kept my Father's commandments, keep my commandments. And he said that this is evidence. This is the proof of your love for me. You know, how, you know how it is when somebody just keeps on doing something and yet, you know, they keep saying sorry? I mean, is that, is that, genuine, is that genuine repentance and love if they just keep on repeating? Now, I understand the struggle. But listen, family, when we are genuinely, uh, when we are genuinely sincere and we are, and we are um, wanting to follow Christ, God provides everything that we need, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, I believe it's verses 1, 1, 2, and 3, where it talks about, and 4, where it says that he will provide everything for life and godliness. Whatever we need, God will provide it. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to try to do this all on our own? I'm, I'm thankful, I'm grateful that I don't have to try to Try to walk this thing alone. Try to, try to do this all on my own. Because I'm telling you right now, it's only by the grace and the power of God that any of us can get through anything. Um, the law is not a method for salvation. Rather, it is the standard for Christian behavior. behavior. 
The law reveals what the character of our God is. Now, what, is, what did Jesus say we are to do if we love him? Continuing on, John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will do what? Hear that, folks? If anyone loves me, he will what? He will keep my word. Not Pastor Nehemiah, not Pastor Scott, not Pastor Miguel, not Pastor Brent. Jesus' word. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, if you, anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Hey, that's, that's exciting that the God of heaven wants to, wants to make you his home, wants to make you his habitation. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 6. He says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus Christ paid the ransom, Jesus Christ paid the price for you, and you belong to him. And the Spirit of God wants to dwell in you. <laughs> oh, man. Everybody okay out there? I mean, I mean that, that the Spirit of God, God wants to dwell in you? Yeah, this is a nice church building. This is a beautiful church building. Beautiful property, beautiful premises. And while, and while God is here with us tonight in this, in this room, God wants to dwell in you. You are the most important temple. We make up the most important temple. We are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We were not created to be the habitation of demons and devils. That is not why God created us. We were created in his image. We were created to be filled with his spirit. We were created to be the temples of God. Mm, mm, mm. Think of that. What a, what, a, what a high honor that the God of the universe wants to dwell in us, in our hearts, through his spirit. Mm. He who does not love me does not keep my words. I, I'm hoping that, this, that these things are sticking with us. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father, but the Father's who sent me. Okay? John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my what? You will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his what? Love. Oh, man, that love relationship. Question number 11. What is, the sinful man, what is the sinful mind's response to God's love? What is the natural man, the carnal man, what is our response to God's law? Romans chapter 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is what, everybody? Is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Again, this is talking about the natural man. Because naturally, we don't, we're not in harmony with God's law. We're not in harmony with his will. This is a supernatural thing that has to take place in the heart. That's right. That's right, Tom. And by the way, do you know that even, the Bible even says, man, I'm just trying to, Holy Spirit, help me out here. But I believe it's somewhere in Romans chapter 2. I'm trying to think of the verse. But Romans, it tells us, Paul says that, and he says it a couple of times. He says that, even repentance, repentance is a gift from God, that we don't even know how to repent without the aid of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? So in other words, we even need the Holy Spirit's help to repent. That because, and I'm, I'm going to speak for myself, because I'm so messed up. Stubborn hard-headed, all of that. And yet, it says that the human heart, the carnal mind, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The only way that it can come into subjection to God's law and subjection to God's will is through the Holy Spirit. Family, we, that's why it's important for us. We need a new heart and a new mind. Would somebody say amen? amen. Yeah. And by the way, I have friends who are in this field of... of uh, you know, they're, they're, they're heart surgeons. I know, one, I know one Dr. Ben Carson. 
I know him personally too. We're on a prayer line together at times at eight o'clock in the morning with folks that are, that are across the country who are praying, who are praying for each other, praying for our homes, praying for our nation. And ben, Dr. Ben Carson will even tell you that that's why in this book, Gifted Hands, he understood and he wrote, he wrote that, man, I was, I was led and, and, and it was God who helped me many times to perform these surgeries. There's not, there's not one heart surgeon in the entire world that can perform their own heart surgery. They need somebody else to do that for them. The same applies spiritually. There's not one single person in the room, this preacher included, that can change their own heart and their own mind. That can only happen through the power of the Holy Ghost. Only God can perform that operation. That's what it's talking about here. But praise be to God. Praise be to God. Man, he is an awesome physician. He can do it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Pastor Nehemiah, how then can we obey God's law? Just shared it. Here's another text from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 25 and 27. Ooh. Love this one. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 and 27. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new what? God says, I will give you a what? A new heart. And put a new spirit within you. I will take that heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. Now notice what happens as a result. And cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Again, the order is not reversed. We, don't try to, we, do, we, do, we do not attempt to keep the law in order to gain salvation. No, 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 no. Not according to this. According to this, we need revival. We need a new heart. We need a new mind. And as God is doing this in us, guess what? He will bring us into harmony with his statutes, his judgments, and his law. Now, by the way, you might be asking, how do we know that the Ten, that the Ten Commandment law has always been in existence? I'm not going to stay on this too long because for the sake of time, and I just have a few more questions to go. But again... By the law, we have the knowledge of what, everybody? Sin. And sin is the breaking or the transgression of God's what? Law. Okay? Here's how we know. Prior to God giving Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, written on stone. Sapphire stone, yes, sir. That, that, that blue. That blue, by the way, by, by the, way in, in, in the in the word, and I'm thankful that Tom was reminding me of this tonight. In the Word of God, blue, the color blue, um, is a color for God's law. Do you know that? Um, is it any wonder then that the sky is blue and the ocean is blue because we're surrounded by God's love? Got that from Tom. And by the way, on, on, the, on, the, on the garments of, of the priests and, and those in Israel, they, it says that they wore a ribbon of blue on their sleeves and on the, on the borders of their garment. Yep, right there too. To remind them of God's what? That's right. So, how do we know then that the law has always existed? Well, in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, our parents disobey God and eat of the forbidden tree. And as a result, open up the floodgates of sin, suffering, sickness, and death upon the world. How do, how do we know that murder is murder? Well, in Genesis chapter 4, remember what God said to Cain? God said, listen, if you just obey what, I'm, what, I, what I share with you, you'll be well. But if not, here's the language, here's, what, here's the word. He said, sin lies at the door. And because, because Cain disobeyed God and continued in that disobedience, did he commit sin? Did he murder his brother? Yeah. And we can go on and on. I mean, you can go all the way up and through the flood. You can go all the way past that. I'm going to even fast forward to Genesis chapter 39. 
where Joseph finds himself with Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife, according to the Bible, tried to get Joseph to sleep with her. What was Joseph's response? He says, how can I do this wickedness in the sight of God? So do, do we understand that Joseph knew something of adultery? Absolutely. And we can go on. Oh, there, so, the Bible is littered with examples prior to God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. So the principles of God's law have always been in existence. How do we know? Because, again, the principle of love is eternal as God himself. Let's, let's take a look at some of this. Question number 13. What will be our response to God's law when we allow his spirit to control us? Psalm chapter 119, verse 20, it says, My soul breaks with longing for your judgment at how many times? At all times. So in other words, we have a longing and a yearning, right? It's called repentance when we, when we recognize and realize that we're actually breaking God's heart. Okay? Question number 14. How did Jesus sum up the law and the prophets? How did he sum up? And this is, this is where I'm starting to bring this down to a close. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Okay? Context. Context, Jesus just, man, he just put the, the, the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, right, to silence. And so they sent a lawyer, an expert in the law, right? And the question is asked, Master, what, what law, what commandment, what's the most important commandment in the law, right? What is the great law? And Jesus responded this way. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with how much? All of your heart. How much of your soul? All your soul and your mind. All your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your what? Neighbor as yourself. And then notice this. On these two commandments hang all the law and the what? Prophets. So simply put, simply put, the Ten Commandment law is, 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 is uh, summarized this way by Jesus. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Would you say amen? That's, 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 the, that's the Ten Commandments. How do we know? Well, I'm going to just, for the sake of time, real, really quickly. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God, that vertical relationship. The first one is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right? And you can look at that commandment, but he says, thou shalt have no other God before me. Question, is that still a good commandment? Okay. The second one, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any idols, and nor shall you bow down yourself to them and serve them. Still good? Okay. So in other words, anything, and by the way, an idol is not just something that we, that we make and prop up and bow down before it. There are many idols. There are many things that we can bow ourselves down to. And by the way, the greatest idol of them all is self. Yep. And we bow. Self sits on the throne of our hearts. So, that commandment is still good. What's commandment number three? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in what? In vain. Still good? By the way, it's not just talking about using God's name in a curse word. It's not just that. It's not just irreverently speaking his name. It's not just, you know, using his name in crude and bad jokes. It's not just um, speaking his name in such a way that, that, uh, that is disrespectful. Do you know that the greatest way in which we can bring, uh, take the Lord's name in vain is when we profess to be the children of God, when we profess to be Christians, and yet our lives are not in harmony with God's will. Because we can say we're Christians all we like. But, it, but if, we're, if, if our lives are not in harmony with the Word of God, if we're doing our own thing, then guess what? Our profession means nothing. Our words are empty. We can say all we want. And listen, do you know that what makes the first four commandments Visible to everybody? Because people don't, trust me, and I've been out and about, I've been around in, in various communities and among different people groups. People can care less about your profession of who you are and, and that you have this relationship with an invisible God. You know why they don't care? Because if we don't show that we care, they won't care. 
Because what makes the, the first four commandments even more relevant, even invisible, is the way that we treat one another. Because in 1 John, 1 John, I believe it's chapter, oh, help me out here, Pastor, 4, I believe it's verse 20. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21 basically says this. If a man say that he loves God and hates his brother, <laughs> <laughs> the Bible says, if a man say that he loves God and hates his brother, he's a liar. How can a man hate his brother who he sees and says that he loves God who he does not see? Huh? So we can, we can say it with our mouth all we want, that we love God, but the evidence and the proof of that is the way that we treat our neighbor. So we can talk all we want to. We can preach all we want to. We can get up here and do praise and worship all we want to. We can do all this stuff. But if we don't have love for our neighbor, <laughs> oh. and it's funny because the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love chapter, he says, man, you can do all this stuff, but man, you end up sounding like a, like a, like a clanging brass and a, and a tinkling cymbal, like you're just a bunch of noise. The, the proof, the proof and the evidence that we love God is when we love one another. You know when folks come walking onto these premises and come walking to the church? They ought to see the love of God among his people. Even this right here is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can pull something like this off. What do you mean, Pastor? The fact that we're all different, the fact that we all come from different backgrounds, different families, we all have different temperaments. We all, we all have different personalities. We all have different likes and dislikes. And we all have different views and hold different positions and have different perspectives. And yet, by God's grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're all sitting in the same room. And I can love you. Whether, listen, by the grace of God, I can love you whether you agree with me or not. And I can respect you. I'd be like, hey, hey you're still my brother. You're still my sister. Amen, family. So check this, that's, what, that's what we're talking about, okay? What about the fourth commandment? Let's, let's, let's continue on. Fourth commandment is this one, and it's right, at, it's right in the heart and the center of the law. It's interesting, but it has to, both of them have to do with family, the fourth and the fifth. The fourth one is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Interesting that God would say remember. Could it be that man would forget? I don't know, maybe. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's keep it moving. Now let's go to our neighbor. Who's our nearest neighbor? Honor thy father and thy mother. Love your parents and respect them. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So, five. What, what's number six, everybody? Thou shalt not what? Say again. Thou shalt not murder, okay? Jesus said that even if you have hatred in your heart towards your brother without a cause and you want to see them harmed or, or worse, that's sin. If you have that in your mind, that's sin. What's number seven? Thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. Is God trying to protect the marriage? <laughs> in fact, the greatest analogy of relationship that we find in the Bible is Jesus and his bride, the church, or God and his people. Mm -hmm. What's number eight? Thou shalt not what? Steal. Steal good? Are we, are we to respect other people's properties and things? Yeah. How about number nine? Thou shalt not bear false what? Witness. Don't lie. Don't exaggerate. Don't call in sick when you're not sick. Oh, everybody like, whoa, oh, pastor, man, you actually said that? Yeah, I said that. I mean, as Christians, shouldn't we be? Come on, folks, come on now. We shouldn't be like calling in, fake coughing. 
Hey, boss. <laughs> Man, I'm not feeling good today. And what do you do? I mean, I'm just talking about being, you know, are we being honest on our taxes? Are we, are we being honest with tithes and offerings? Re- remember who we represent here. Yeah. I, I remember, man, I was, and I'm almost done, folks, and we'll go right into Q&A. I remember I was working for the city of Seattle. We were down in this excavation and all of this. And, man, I, you know, I was down there with the, uh, with the spade gun and the tunnel gun, breaking up all this dirt and concrete and all this other stuff so we can lay these cables down, down in the excavation, right? Power lines in downtown Seattle. And I remember this one guy said to me, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, let's slow down. Slow down, man. He's like, you think these guys appreciate you? You think that, you know, management and all these guys, these uppers appreciate you, man? Slow down, man. I was like, I can't, man. He's like, why? I said, because of Jesus. He's like, oh, you're one of those guys. I said, hey, man. And it's not just about work ethic, it's about being an example. You know, it's about integrity. I remember when I told my boss, man, you know, the, my supervisor, right, be, right before I was hired on to Seattle City Light, he said, you know, are you going to have any issue with the weekend? I said, yeah. He said, what do you mean? He said, I told him, well, I'm a Christian and, you know, my relationship with God takes precedence over everything else. And then he said to me, so you mean to tell me that you're willing to turn down this job offer just for your conviction? I said, yeah. He said, you know what? You're hired. Because that's the kind of guys we want on this crew, in this place. And I'm not, you know, I'm just giving God all the praise and glory for it. And while I was there, praise be to God, share Jesus with all my crew. A lot of them, man, wouldn't cuss, wouldn't cuss around me. But here's the thing, and, and there was a young man there that loved Jesus, all of 19 years of age. His name is Dion. Man, loved Jesus. This guy, I remember when I first came to Seattle City Light 2, I was not in Christ. You guys hear about, more about the story. I was not in Jesus. Um, I, I went back to the streets. I was doing all of that stuff. Left ministry, left God, left it all. But this kid, Help bring me back to Jesus. And he drove me absolutely nuts. I remember the first day I met him and the crew, we introduced ourselves. I said, I'm Nehemiah. He says, I'm Dion. And around here, it's all about Jesus. Like, keep my hand back. <laughs> and then, then on top of that, the supervisor put me in his truck for the next two months to go to and from the job site. And you know what this guy was doing? We get in there, he'd be like, man, it's okay if I say a prayer? Knock yourself out. And then, he, then he'd crank up that Christian music in the truck. Then we get over there to the job site, and this guy's dropping object lessons. We're down there, we're doing that work, and then he taps me on the shoulder. I say, what's up? He points to the ladder. He says, you see that ladder, Nehemiah? I said, yep, I see that ladder. I said, what about it? He said, that's Jesus. He's that ladder. And the only way out of here, bro, is through Jesus. I said, okay. And the guys up top were all laughing because every time Dion was in the excavation or trench, we had church. Amen? We had church. Even when we went down to repair a sewer line, a broken sewer line, this brother gets down in there. We go down. He tells me, hey, look, you got to go down. It's our turn, Nehemiah. I'm like, bruh. So we go down there, hip waders, Tyvek suits, masks, and this guy steps in. It's like, it, it's, 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 it's up here. We're still, and that stuff is still coming out fresh. And this guy is over here like, thank you, Jesus, for saving me from my mess. Bruh. Can I tell you something, Brittany and and, uh, Donovan? It was right in that cesspool that I had an encounter with Jesus because of that young man. And I came back to Christ. Would you say amen? Amen. Came back to Jesus. 
That guy's still in love with Jesus. He's still crazy. All right, let's finish this up. How is love to God? Oh, um, so that, that's, the, that's commandment number nine. Commandment number ten, thou shalt not what? Covet. Thou shalt not covet. Love to God, love to your neighbor. And when Jesus said, upon, upon these two hang all the law and the prophets, well, guess what else hangs at the bottom of your arms? Ten fingers. Do you know that, that physiology and in your DNA, the law of God is written all over you because you are made in the image of God? Oh, you guys didn't know that? Ten. Ten toes. By the way, your feet, foundation that you stand on, the law of God. Love to God and love to man, right? Well, there's two, right? Love to God, love to man. 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 Now, thankfully, we only have one mouth. Right? Some of us. And, and, and think about it, your lungs, your kidneys, everything. Your whole, your whole physiology. No wonder why. No wonder why the psalmist in 139, Psalm 139, verse 14 says, um, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And this my soul knows so well. Marvelous are your works. So now you got a different perspective whenever you're walking around. You are a walking billboard for Jesus. Okay, how is love to God displayed? First John chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God. Notice what John said, this is what the love of God is. What is the love of God? That we keep his what? That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? 16, what is evident of those who say they love God and do not obey? First John chapter, th chapter 2, verses 3, 3 to 5. Now by this we know that we know him, ooh, if we keep his what? So the way that we know him is that we keep his commandments. He who says, now check this out, this is not my words, this is the, this is the word of God. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a what? Is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Last two questions. How are God's people described in the last days? Check this out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. The Bible says that the dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman. I'm just dropping some, some things so that you know ahead of time as we're going to get there. The dragon was enraged with the woman. The woman symbolizes the church in Bible prophecy. Don't have the time tonight to unpack that. And, went, and he went, Satan went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who are they? Who are they and what are they doing? It says, who keep the what? Who keep the commandments of God and what else do they possess? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? Verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who do what? Who keep the commandments of God and what else do they possess? And the faith of Jesus. Would you say amen? It's the Bible. So who is, who is, Satan, at, who is Satan at war with? Those who honor God. Those who keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about, listen, this is not a buffet where we can pick and choose. We can't pick and choose what we like from the word of God and discard whatever we don't like. There are things, in, I mean, the word of God, there, is, there are non-negotiables. Okay? Last question. Did Jesus commission his believers to teach people to obey everything he commanded us? The great commission in Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, this is what Jesus said. Teaching them to what? To observe how many things? All things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Would you say amen? So God, Jesus Christ commissioned us. 
He's, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So this is the law, law of love. Let me, let me close. Pastor, I'm sorry. I don't know if we'll, we'll get to Q&A tonight. We might be able to take one question, but I have, a, I, have, uh, I have an illustration that I'd like to use tonight. Because, again, in the Christian world, there are many, there, there, there's a belief that the law of God is no longer binding, that, you know, that we don't need the law of God. You know, we're, because of grace, you know, the law of God no longer matters. Listen, folks, that grace is not given to disobey. Grace is given to bring us into harmony with God's will and so that we can obey. Amen? That's what it's, that's what it's about. So I'm going to need some help tonight. I'm going to need some help tonight. Primo, yeah, thank you. Um, sis, would you come up? I, I, need, I, need, um, I need a dear sister who can be um, the church for me tonight. Okay? And if you can stand right over here and hold this here. Right? Okay? And uh, you can be the people, Primo. And stand in front of her. And, oh, the preacher. There you go, Will. Come over here, my brother. And this is the gospel. Good news. All right. Uh, let me see. Pastor Miguel. Oh, okay. Kevin, come on. Man, you know what? You have the distinct honor of being Jesus. All right. Can I get a sister? I need one more sister. Come on, Brittany. I want you to be Grace. All right. And thank you for volunteering. Okay? Right here. And then, Gilbert, sorry, my brother. You got to be sin. <laughs> I, 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 man, I'm so sorry. I, I really am. I'm, I'm so sorry. Okay? And then, Robert, can you please come? I'll have you be the law. Okay. Now, this is important. Why? Because if we go by, if we go by this concept or idea that the law of God is, is no longer needed, right? Here, here's how the argument falls apart. Because according to what we read in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says that by the law, we have the knowledge of what? Sin. And sin is the transgression of God's what? Law. And so therefore, it is the law that reveals to us. And by the way, again, the law is God's character. It's a transcript of his character. The book of James says the law is actually like a mirror. And when we look into the mirror, it reveals to us our defects, right? It reveals to us how messed up we are. But praise be to God, listen to this, but praise be to God. The law, the law, when it brings conviction, when it shows us our true condition, guess what else it, po guess what else it points to? It points to the one who can help us, which is Jesus. Amen? That's why the Bible says that Jesus is the end of the law. <laughs> that doesn't mean he puts an end to the law. It just means that at the end of the law, you, it points us to Jesus. He's the only one that can help us, right? So the law, re the, the, the mirror reveals the defects and the flaws and how messed up we are, but it also reveals that we need grace and that we need Jesus, the grace of God, right? That's right. So let's, 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 let's do this tonight. I want you guys to repeat loud and clear as I point to each one. I'm going to say now the go to to hear the preach the of and is amazing which saves us from which is the breaking of God's good. See? That right there. One more time and then we're going to break this down. Now the go to to hear the preach the of and is amazing, which saves us from, which is the breaking of God's law. Now, listen to what happens. If it's true that there's no law, then notice what happens. So law, if you would have a seat, please. Thank you. Let's do this again. Now the go to, to hear the, preach the of and his, which saves us from, which is the breaking of God's. Okay, if there's no law. That means that we have no definition of what? Sin. 
So, sin, have a seat. Gilbert. Now the go to to hear the preach the of and is amazing which saves us from hold up no sin no I mean no law no sin which means that we need no what grace now the go to to hear the preach the of and is amazing hold up no law, no sin, no grace, no need for who? Oh, you said that, not me. I can't, I can't imagine ever a time when we don't need Jesus. Amen? Now the go to, to hear the, preach the of, no Jesus, no good news. Have a seat, my brother. Now, sadly, this is what many people go to church for. Now the go to to hear the preach what? Fluff. Second Timothy chapter four. Listen, Second Timothy chapter four. Check this out. You know that the Apostle Paul said that another sign of the end of time is that there are going to be people who have itching ears. And they will, they will only sit under and listen to those who preach smooth things. Things that they want to hear. Things that tickle their fancy. Things that keep them in their carnal ways. Whatever you do, preacher, don't call us to repentance. Whatever you do, don't preach about sin. Whatever you do, don't preach about this and that. Don't step on our toes. Preach to us what we want to hear. Now the go to why? I mean, isn't isn't that a isn't that a a, a, a a fair question to ask? Why are we even here in church? Why if 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 the law of God no longer exists and the law of God is no longer um, you know relevant and, and and it doesn't matter, then why be here? Why not just go out and do your own thing and do what we want to do? You know why? Because the law of God is as eternal as God himself and cannot and will not be changed. Would you say amen? And so family, the reason why we're here is I believe with all my heart that the spirit of God brought us here. And not only that, but we are recognizing that we need Jesus. And by the way, and you're going to have a seat, church and, and people. Thank you so much for helping me out with the illustration. By the way, in the book of Hebrews, and this is, my last, this is my last text for tonight. The book of Hebrews, in chapters 8 and 10. Book of Hebrews, chapters 8 and 10, you don't have to turn there, but you can find it. It is written there about a new covenant. And I am a new covenant Christian, are you? I'm a new covenant Christian too. What is the new covenant? The Bible says that God will put his law in our minds and write them on the tables of our heart. No longer on, on, on tables of stone, but upon our hearts and upon our minds. Bringing us into harmony with himself and with his will. I want to make this closing appeal. There are many times in my life where I've broken the law and there were consequences. Court dates, jail cells, all of that. And I'm thankful though that even, even though I did all of that and even I was all messed up and things like that, I'm thankful for the grace of God and the mercy of God brought me out of that and brought me into harmony with his will and with his word. Now, do I have it all together? Am I perfect? Have I arrived? But I'm thankful for Jesus.
He'll never fail us. And I know that there are going to be, in the, in the upcoming days and weeks as you're contemplating a decision, there's going to be some wrestling going on. Because one thing for sure, the devil hates God's word. And he hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he does not want us to come into harmony with his will. He does not want us to come into harmony with um, God's will and a relationship with God. So he's going to pull out all the stops. But I pray that the Spirit of God will move you to make the best decision of your life by submitting and giving your heart to Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, I want to be faithful. I want to follow. I want to follow your way. I want to follow your commandments. If that's your desire tonight, would you raise your hand? If that's your desire. Lord, I, I understand the message. I heard it. It's clear to me. I want to follow you. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much. I know we took a little extra time, Lord, to, to really cover this important topic, but Father, it was needed because the devil hates this message. He hates, Lord, whenever we present your love and, 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 and the foundation of your government. He hates when we present your character as, as revealed in the law. He hates, Lord, that you have the power to bring us into harmony with your will and with your law. He hates all of that. But Father, we are so thankful because your, your word tells us in 1 John chapter 4, it says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We're so thankful for the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, tonight I just pray that you'll be with my family, be with all those that are here in person and those who are following along online. Father, bring us into harmony with your law and with your will. And Lord, I pray that your love will abide in our hearts for one another, for each other, and most of all, Lord, for you. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor. One question, one question. Here's the question. This is from somebody who texted it to me. Ready? Go ahead. How does the upright man's righteousness endure forever if our righteousness is as filthy rags? Yeah, that's a great question. Great question. Well, here's the, here's the key. Um, I know that the text, what it said, but it's important also to look at other texts and, and the, the, the main, here's the main thing. Isaiah 64 verse 6 does state that our righteousness is as filthy rags. However, over there in Matthew chapter 5 verse 20, Jesus said that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what was Jesus saying? He was saying that your righteousness and my righteousness doesn't count and will not get us to the kingdom. So whose righteousness then can we have in order to get to the kingdom? It's only the righteousness of Jesus. It's only his righteousness that counts. And, and so, um, and by the way, his righteousness is, is, uh, is a gift to us. And I want to um, make sure that I, because Christ is... Um, our righteousness okay that that's important and so I, I wanted to answer that question by saying that our righteousness he's right whoever whoever sent that question in they're correct our righteousness is filthy rights because the Bible states that and we cannot get to the kingdom by our own righteousness here's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 it says God made him check this out God made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him 
So do you see the, do you see the trade-off? Do you, do you see the exchange? And what a beautiful trade-off it is. What a beautiful exchange, Brother Dennis, that it is. That Christ would take all of our sin, right? And become sin. So that we can be what? The righteousness of God in who? In Him. And, and you know, it's so beautiful because I've often wondered, and I'm going to close with this. In John chapter 3, beginning at verse 14 to 15, there's a, there's a powerful meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus. You guys remember that? That secret interview. And here's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, just as God, or just as Moses raised the serpent up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man also be lifted up. And I've often wondered, you know, about sin, right? How can Jesus, because what Jesus is talking about is a story that's found in Numbers chapter 21. When all the people of Israel were traveling through the wilderness and they were complaining and murmuring against God and his servant, and then all these serpents came out and began to bite them, right? And people were dying. What did God instruct Moses to do? He told Moses to get a pole, to fashion a bronze serpent and put it on that pole. And then he told Moses to instruct the people to do what? To look at that. And by looking and by faith, they would be what? They will be healed. A serpent. Now, what is a serpent usually in Scripture? But why would Jesus compare himself to a serpent or say that just as Moses lifted up the serpent, I will be lifted up? Well, we just read it. It's because he became sin by taking all of our sin. Right? And he gives us his righteousness. Praise be to God that the righteousness of God is a gift to each and every one of us because none of us can produce it, none of us can manufacture it, and none of us can buy it. It's a gift from God. Would you say amen? Praise God. Thank you for the question. Pastor. So tomorrow night's topic is? Tomorrow night's topic is the Sabbath, God's sign of rest and faith. The Sabbath, God's sign of rest and faith. You don't want to miss it. Again, it's part of the Ten Commandment Law. It's right there at the heart of the moral law. So come tomorrow night, invite a friend, and uh, we will be blessed by God's Word. Okay? Amen. Good night. Hey, thank you for coming out, and you're more than welcome to stay for refreshments. They have some good, good stuff uh, prepared. So God bless you, and thank you again for coming out. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Good night.